Hello, everyone. And on behalf of the LitFest Board of Trustees, welcome to this 42nd Lancaster Literature Festival. As many of you know, after a successful opening weekend, LitFest 2020 had to be cancelled due to COVID-19. So for this year's festival, our volunteers board realised it had to work in a different way and decided to create a diverse and inclusive festival to be delivered entirely free and entirely online. With support from Lancaster City Council, an Arts Council England project grant, our sponsors and partners, our aim as we near the end of this long winter lockdown has been to bring ashore a rich cargo of fiction, poetry, illustration and ideas, plus all kinds of activities and challenges in the form of a free online festival. In fact, just like the book of the ship of books cresting its stormy waves on the front of our festival programme. And as a registered charity with no regular Arts Council funding, if we're able to, to be able to go on creating exciting projects and events, bringing the best in world literature and ideas to the northwest west of England and to our international audiences, we are going to need your help. During the event, a donate button will appear on your screen. But depending on your connectivity, you may prefer to visit our website once the event is over at www.litfest.org. The important thing is that every gift will help us to build towards that future where we can all really meet again. But for now, though physically distanced, we are at least socially together. Now, one of the big four projects we have created for LitFest 2021 is how we live next. That is, after COVID, after Brexit, and in the face of the climate crisis. It's a series of five events running throughout this weekend. So Michael Marmot and Fatima Ibrahim have spoken brilliantly about health and environment. And today, James Sussman and Johnny Pitts will speak about work and social justice. And each of these events will last about an hour. The series will culminate in a slightly longer panel discussion lasting around an hour and a half, starting this afternoon at 5 p.m. Moderated by the philosopher A.C. Grayling, and with a consciously local focus, the panel includes Robert Barrett of Eden North in Morecambe, Mark Cropper of the papermakers James Cropper, Lancaster City Councillor Gina Dowding, and Lancashire's Director of Public Health and Wellbeing, Dr. Sakthi Karananithi. In the last 15 minutes of all the talks, there will be an opportunity to ask questions, and, the panel dis and in the panel discussion, there will be a longer opportunity of about half an hour. So that's, that's the plan. And now let me introduce this morning's speaker. James Sussman is an anthropologist specializing in the Khoisan uh, peoples of Southern Africa. He is the author of Affluence Without Abundance and is currently the director of Anthropos Limited, a think tank that applies anthropological methods to solving contemporary social and economic problems. He has advised numerous community, government, and non government organizations, including Oxfam, the European Commission, and the African Development Bank, and has written for the New York Times, The Observer, um, and The New Statesman, among other publications. And his most recent book, which, uh, from which he'll be speaking this morning, is called Work. It's an absolutely fascinating and beautifully written history of work from human beginnings, really, until the present. So without more ado, let me um, hand over to James Sussman, who will speak for about 20, 25 minutes. Over to you, James. Thank you, Bill. Um, good morning, everybody. It feels always bizarre to do a lecture where I can't see the white of people's eyes in the front row or hear any chuckles if I make a bad joke. Um, so I'm looking forward to this, nevertheless. And, you know, it's 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 a strange way to do a book tour, um, doing it on Zoom. This year I was meant to be touring around the world following I had the release of the Spanish edition of the book um, this week. Um, and yet I haven't actually left really the space I'm sitting in right now. 
And partially, I haven't been, I've been able to do that, and we're able to do this here today because of really some pretty extraordinary advances in technology. Um, one wonders, you know, what would have happened if we'd had this pandemic 20 years ago, 30 years ago, before we had the ability to interact with one another digitally. And this is, in a sense, one of the big themes about what I'm talking about, which are the going to talk about, which are the implications of the extraordinary advances in technology that we have been through over the last, in particular, 40 years, but really the last 200 years, um, and how it's changed our relationship with work. Um, now, there is another interesting side angle on this, and this is, of course, that over the course of the last year, again, courtesy of this technology, we have been through something of a revolution in the way that we organize our working lives, um, or at least in for some of us. For those of us who work in the knowledge economy or the information economy, which now, as given the nature of our economy, is most of us, 80% of people in Britain work in services sectors, and a good half of that number work at least in the knowledge economy. And these are the ones who have participated in what has been a vast, unplanned, ad hoc experiment in remote working, and one that's been remarkably successful. And it has been a reminder of really our ability to adapt when we need to. As a species, we're incredibly resistant to change. It's the nature of culture in many senses that we will we will continue to do and engage in outmoded norms and practices, even when we know it's bad for us, until we're forced to change. But then when we are forced to change, we adapt extraordinarily well. And in a sense, this is one of the great hopeful messages of the last year and all the grimness that we've endured. Um, but to talk about the context of work, to talk about the history of work, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, first of all, dash back a century or so ago to a time which was, I suppose, similarly troubled, um, to around 1930, the year immediately after the stock market crash, which then cascaded into the Great Depression, which caused all sorts of ructions, in particular in what I suppose we'd call the industrialized world. And I'm going to talk about one particular man in this context, and that is the economist John Maynard Keynes. Um, and he's one of the few economists that us anthropologists actually tend to quite like, <laughs> even though we don't, we don't always agree with him. Now, in 1930, John Maynard Keynes had actually lost most of his personal fortune um, in the stock market crash of the preceding year. And he'd returned to Cambridge, um, where he basically moved in firstly with his parents and then into the bursar's office at King's College. And while there, he wrote an extraordinary essay, an essay which really got lost in the seeds of time until around five or six years ago, when suddenly people started paying attention to it. And it's an essay he called The Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. And in it, what he wanted to do was he wanted to effectively remind his audience not to get lost in the short-term miseries of what they were enduring at the time. And so in the, the aim of his essay was to take wings into the future, a century forward, so that he could give people a perspective on where they were and put the Great Depression as it was in perspective as he saw it. Um, and in doing so, what he did was he described what he imagined the world of work and what the economic world would look like round about now, 2030, technically, as he said, a century Hence, and the world he described was something of an economic utopia, um, an economic promised land, as he called it. And the reason that we'd achieved this economic promised land was technological advances, improvements in productivity, and capital growth. And this economic promised land had one characteristic which was very clear, and that was nobody worked more than 15 hours a week. Um, now, the reason he argued that this would reach this promised land was that through he did a series of calculations of potential thresholds in terms of productivity, capital growth, and uh, technological advances, and suggested that really by 2030, everybody's basic needs would be easily met on the basis of a very short work week. That in other words, we would be prosperous enough and affluent enough that we would ultimately to be required to endure this endless process 
of work, this endless process of jobbing. Um, now, he imagined when he described this, um, he viewed this not really as just a sort of a, a slow drift into leisure. He viewed this as really the crowning achievement of humankind. Um, so this transition, this economic revolution that he predicted, he called um, really the solution to what he described, and I'm reading now, the most pressing problem of the human race, um, but also the entire biological kingdom from the beginnings of life in its most primitive forms. Now, he talked about this as the solution to what he called the economic problem. Now, the economic problem is also something referred to by economists as the problem of scarcity. And that is the engine um, of economics, I suppose. What people argue with the economic problem is that it is the very base thing behind why we work. It is the base principle behind why we we do what we do, why we accumulate wealth, and so on and so forth. And the reason he argued this um, is that because the economic problem is the engine of the economy. Now, when we talk about the economic problem, and when Keynes talked about the economic problem and the problem of scarcity, it's based on this assumption that humankind um, went through in an evolutionary process from really the beginnings of beginnings of time that our hunter-gatherer ancestors endured a battle, a constant battle for starva against starvation and a constant battle for survival. And that is a response to this. What they did was they effectively evolved to focus on accumulating resources, to focus on making, you know, having enough food today. The idea was, would be simply a, 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 a a trigger to worry about whether we have enough food tomorrow. Now, the economic problem and the problem of scarcity holds that as a species, we are creatures with infinite needs and limited means. And by that, we really mean that we constantly want more than we have, that we are. it is impossible to satisfy us. And it is this idea, this fundamental idea, that we have infinite needs and limited means that underwrites pretty much all of our economic institutions and structures and norms and behaviors today. Um, and it is, as I said, it's assumed that this is part of our genetic inheritance from when we were hunter-gatherers. Um, now, as far as Keynes was concerned, the productivity arising from technology would finally solve the economic problem or the problem of scarcity. And as a result, orthodox economics could be thrown out the window effectively, that this would be the end of the traditional economy as we knew it, and that we'd have to adapt to entirely new ways of working and living. Now, Keynes clearly got a few things wrong. Now, the first one is that we're pretty much um, we're pretty much near 2030, um, and we're certainly not only working um, 15 hours a week. But another thing he got wrong was actually the thresholds he identified would need to pass in terms of productivity, in terms of capital growth, and in terms of technology, we passed long ago. Um, by some calculations, 1980, and certainly the technological advances have been beyond, I imagined, anything that Keynes could have imagined. But yet we are still working as we do. And in many ways, the reason I set out to write this book was to try and ans answer this problem or to try and explore the problem of why we continue to still work as we do. And part of the reason for my interest in it was because of another thing that Keynes got wrong. When he described the economic problem, the problem of scarcity is the most pressing problem of our species from the beginning of time. He made a mistake as well, because we now realize and we now know that actually for most of human history, which we now know extends back possibly 300 millennia, and that is now the oldest evidence for when our species emerged, which is considerably older than we thought five years ago. It's considerably older than when I did my anthropology degree. Um, 30 years ago, when we were actually speculating that, you know, I suppose cognitively modern Homo sapiens had only been around for perhaps 40,000 years. So we're talking 300 millennia of hunting and gathering. Um, and the evidence, what evidence we have on hunter gatherers actually suggests that our hunter gatherer ancestors did not endure the problem of scarcity in the same way that we do. In fact, they weren't preoccupied with scarcity at all. 
Now, there are limits to what we can infer from the genomic data that allows us to trace back our species that far. There are also limits to what we can infer from the various broken tools and the bones that are the remnants of really hunter-gatherer life that we as archaeologists can engage with. Um, so what we have to do to try and get a sense of how our hunter-gatherer ancestors lived is really to look for more contemporary analogues. And towards the end of the last century, that is precisely what a group of anthropologists did. Beginning in 1960, they came up with what doesn't seem a particularly radical idea now, but it certainly was a radical idea then, that actually by going and seeking out any of the handful of societies that really through spatial isolation continued to hunt and gather into the late 20th century might offer insights into how our ancient hunting and gathering ancestors lived, and at the same time offer us insights into what they believe would be humankind shed of all the accretions of modernity. What is our natural selves? Um, amongst these studies, one of the most important and arguably the most influential in the long term was one undertaken by a man called Richard Borche Lee, um, who was a Canadian anthropologist studying then in the United States. And what he decided, along with a, one of his research partners, was to head to the Kalahari Desert in southern Africa and to Botswana and northern Namibia and to spend time working with a group of Kalahari, what they call Bushmen, San, the group he referred to at the time, he referred to them as the Khan, um, and but we now refer to them as the Jumasi. And these are the people that I've spent most of my adult life working with. Um, and really documenting their often traumatic engagement with the expanding modern economy. Now, when Richard Lee went out in 1963, I believe, it was in the middle of a terrible drought year. And to get to the part of the Kalahari where he, um, uh, where he wanted to do his fieldwork with the Jindwasi, he had to go through many pastoralist communities. And during this terrible drought year, um, these communities were struggling. They were sustained by external aid. So there was an early United Nations effort to feed people there. And he was concerned that the extent of this drought would undermine any kind of view he'd have about how hunter-gatherers organized their economic and working lives. Um, when he got to um, a place called Tuta, um, which was his field work base, he was surprised to discover that the Jinwasi the Bushmen there were largely unaware of the troubles that were happening further to the south in Botswana, that people were getting food aid, and they were reasonably well nourished and um, in reasonably good, in reasonably good health. While everywhere else in Botswana, cattle were dying and people people were struggling. And so what Lee said about doing was doing what you could call a very simple economic input output analysis um, of hunter gatherers. Now, the Kalahari is a tough neighborhood by any standard. Um, it is dry, it rains for only a few months a year. Um, it is the kind of place where you drop an average person, even an enthusiastic survivalist, and they're really not going to last one last long. It requires a lot of specialist knowledge. But for the Jinwasi, it turns out that this environment was considered hugely provident. And this was in part to do with the fact that they had an extraordinary detailed knowledge of how to make a living from it. And hidden within the sand and within the trees, which all look pretty samey when you're a new arrival there, actually are hundreds of different species, of which around 100 different plant species are edible in different forms. And there are many animal species that were edible too. And what was most interesting was that Lee discovered that the Jinwasi managed to get by and meet all their needs. Rather than have this sort of awful battle for survival, they managed to meet all their basic needs on the basis of between 15 and 17 hours effort in a week, hunting and gathering. And then they'd spend perhaps a similar number of hours um, doing what you might call domestic duties. So that's gathering firewood, making fires, preparing food, making shelters and tending equipment and so on. And then the rest of the time, they spent quite often relaxing. Um, certainly, this was a big feature of life in hunter-gatherer compounds. And it's certainly something that happens all over the place. Um, and also spending time doing other activities, things that brought them pleasure, whether it was making music, whether it was playing, whether it was singing and dancing, whether it was flirting, whether it was socializing, whether it was telling stories, whether it was telling jokes, or just getting on really with life in a sort of fairly, fairly relaxed way.
Now, this was, of course, a huge revelation. Um, this was evidence very clear that hunter-gatherers living in a tough place didn't endure anything like the stereotypical hardship that we imagined or that everybody had up to then imagined life for hunter-gatherers were, this sort of Hobbesian battle against um, a tough environment in an eat-or-be-eaten world. Now, Lee returned with his data, um, looking at how hard they worked, and at the same time, other people came back with data from their fieldwork as well. Um, amongst them was, for example, James Woodburn, who lives um, down the road from me here in Cambridge. And he'd gone to work in Tanzania, in around Lake Ayasi, with the Hadza Bay hunter-gatherers. And he discovered that actually the data was very similar as well. He talked about the food quest being irregular, intermittent, and done in the short term. And he actually talked about how the Hadza Bay, in particular the men who were responsible for hunting, actually spent most of their time just playing small stakes gambling games for arrows. Um, that was their principal amusement, and they viewed going out and getting food as almost akin to us going to takeaways. Um, so it produced this, you know, and then we had a whole bunch of other data from other places in the world, from India, from Australia, also from the Arctic and from Amazonia. And it all seemed to confirm this idea that hunter-gatherers typically worked far less than we do now. Now, the reason that they worked far less than we do now was not simply because life was incredibly easy for them. It could be very difficult. Um, and indeed, in the Kalahari, life does sometimes get difficult. Now, um, what they established, though, was it was the basis of a very different set of economic attitudes around the concept of scarcity. Um, now, hunter-gatherers, the Jumasi, for example, describe their environment generally as provident as generous. So when we look at an environment like that and we think of it as scarce, how are we going to extract a living from it? What work do we have to do to get to it? They viewed it as generous and sharing, and they talked about the environment sharing food and resources with them pretty much unconditionally. And as a result of that, they didn't feel the need to work very hard. So they didn't focus, for example, on ever accruing surpluses. In fact, surpluses they viewed as something which was ultimately socially destructive, because the minute you start accruing and controlling surpluses, it becomes a source of social tension. So people only ever worked to meet their immediate needs. Um, and this was very much the case with hunter-gatherer societies across the globe. There were variations in how people organized themselves, variations in the way people described their environments, but pretty much all of them focused, one, on meeting their immediate needs rather than long-term needs with their work. Um, two, that they didn't care for surpluses. Three, that they were highly egalitarian societies. Um, and four, that they really did not view hard work as a virtue or idleness as a vice. And in fact, because work was, was so intermittent, um, they were actually extraordinarily tolerant of things like freeloaders. You know, in our society, we tend to think of freeloaders as a burden. Um, and, you know, we're depending on, you know, it's one of the few things the right and the left seem to agree on is that they dislike freeloaders. They just disagree who the worst freeloaders are. Those on the right of the spectrum tend to point fingers at the idle poor, whereas those on the left tend to point fingers at the idle rich. Um, but anyway, what was clear was that our attitudes to work are not something that we've inherited from our hunter-gatherer ancestors. So it raises another question, where do they come from? Where does our focus on scarcity that uh, economists are so preoccupied with and assume is part of our natures come from? And the answer to that question is something far more recent. It's our transition to agriculture. Um, interestingly enough, when the transition to agriculture, it's one of those things that are much discussed in the archeological world, and it's still very unclear as to precisely why and how it came about. People say, well, if hunting and gathering was so good, why indeed did people um, become farmers? And there's, there's plenty of discussion about it, but we know that they did. Um, and the very likely cause behind it certainly was a response to, in particular, rapidly changing climate over the period between 20,000 and 10,000 years ago, and a rapidly fluctuating climate, which went hot and cold um, before we entered the current um, interglacial warm period. Now, farming involves a great deal more work than hunting and gathering, where hunter-gatherers, for example, were content to rely on hundreds of different plant species that adapted to um, shifting, shifting weather conditions. 
Farmers, on the other hand, tend to depend on one or two plant species. Um, in other words, they tend to put their eggs in one basket, and these tend to be high yielding plant species, like the early forms of wheat, the einkorn and emma wheat that emerged in the in the Levant, where agriculture agriculture was invented. Um, and the job of a farmer really is to try and mimic the ideal conditions for those plants or livestock to thrive. Um, and that requires work because nature doesn't always play ball. So farmer tended to view, you know, where hunter-gatherers viewed their environments as inherently provident. Farmers only ever viewed them as potentially provident. To make an environment provident, you had to put in work. You had to do work. It created this idea that you exchange labor for energy from the environment. Uh, equally importantly with um, farming is that the rewards for your work were always long-term. Where hunter-gatherers went out and they'd go hunting or gathering and effectively harvested food, which they'd eat that day. Most work a farmer does only gives a return sometime in the distant future. Um, so, for example, if one plants um, wheat seeds in early spring, you know, one spends a, all of summer tending the field, dealing with the pests, uh, making sure it's appropriately watered if it needs that. Then one harvests, then one threshes, then one processes, and only rarely, perhaps by Christmas, is one lucky enough to eat a loaf of bread from them. So there's this huge delayed return process. But at the same time, because farming was much more productive and populations grew much quicker, it subjected farmers to a whole series of potential existential risks that hunter-gatherers didn't have to endure. And these risks related to whether it was pests, blight, droughts, frosts, anything could wipe out a harvest. And interestingly, when we now look, through, in particular through the genetic record, which is very interesting, but as well as the archaeological record, in early farming communities, they're endless kind of dead ends. So they're communities that would go and expand into some part of Northern Europe, and then they'd effectively disappear from the genetic record, possibly as a result of a drought, a famine, or as we are all familiar with these days, a zoonotic disease. Now, we know, for example, that the coronavirus that we're enduring now, the likely source of it is, is uh, wild animals. But the truth is, of course, that most zoonotic diseases that we endure, um, flus, tuberculosis, and so on, all come from our domestic animals. And um, so farming cultures, in a sense, subjected themselves to a whole series of new diseases that hunter-gatherers never had to endure. Anyway, the simple answer was that in those societies, work made a difference between your chances of survival. Those who worked hard, those who were most risk averse and did the, went to the most efforts to protect their fields from pests and predators, to ensure that they were properly irrigated, had the highest likelihood of survival. And out of that emerged this kind of working culture that we have, as well as a culture that focused on the urge to accumulate resources. Now, when John Maynard Keynes wrote his essay, the Industrial Revolution had begun to change all of that. The kind of organic relationship between hard work and reward that emerged in farming communities had begun to change because of the productivity of machines, effectively, and the routine exploitation of fossil fuels to power them. So where before then, up until the Industrial Revolution, effectively, the relationship between the energy that people used to do work with was most of the energy they used came from food and most of that energy was spent on procuring food. Suddenly by being able to make use of fossil fuels, they could pump energy into building cities um, and doing all sorts of work which was absolutely unrelated to the food quest. So you had the mushrooming of cities, um, urbanization and a complete change. And this was the engine that persuaded John Maynard Keynes that things were going to change, that things were in the process of changing. And in fact, when the Great Des Depression hit, in that essay he wrote, what he did, he described the Great Depression, which at the time was blamed on an oversupply of labor and an oversupply of goods. So, you know, we hear a lot um, in when we have sort of miserable economic forecasting now, and it's something that I never really made the connection, the great fear of deflation. And I always wondered why deflation was such a terrible thing to fear. And the fear of deflation was that this was something that was associated with the Great Depression, was seen as one of the great causes. Too much labor, too much stuff, everything becoming cheap. Um, Keynes imagined that what we had to do was go through a process of adjusting how we organize not just our economies, but our economic morality, 
in order to adapt to the productivity that we have. And this is certainly where we are now. It seems to me that we haven't made the adaptation that Keynes expected. And we haven't made it because we, in a sense, assume that somehow we are hostage to this desire to continuously want more, to be more, to have more, um, and that we are inveterate workers forged. But we know forged in our era as hunter-gatherers, but we know that we are not. Um, we have the information that we are not. So what this does is it puts us in an interesting position. We are looking at a world where effectively a whole series of environmental pressures, um, which all relate to work, work is ultimately an energy transaction and the best proxy for how much work is actually being done really are greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we're actually at a point where there's a clear case to change our working culture simply because we need to. I mean, as an anthropologist, I have no particular moral views on whether our working culture is a good or bad thing. Culture is ultimately a kind of arbitrary thing, but our working culture risks cannibalizing the prosperity that really it's created for us in the last 200 years. So we risk wasting the affluence we have acquired, which was a famous argument made by John Kenneth Galbraith, the American, um, the American economist, when he wrote the book, The Affluent Society in the 60s. And really that has been the aim my principal aim really in writing this book beyond telling what i hope is actually a really nice interesting and long history of our world through the prism of work has really been to try and sort of break us out of this thinking um that's shaped around scarcity so that we can start engaging with the problems that we face um unshackled by really a set of archaic economic ideas that were forged during a long 10,000 year period where we were farmers living off the land and we had to work hard in order to survive. And certainly that is what I hope we're at. When I talked at the beginning of this talk about, you know, having had this lesson in learning adaptability um, over the course of this, over the course of this pandemic, I'm rather hoping that we take the fact that we've actually learned to break down some shibboleths about work that maybe now, and as we're looking at massive COVID stimulus payments and the, you know, the 1.9 billion stimulus payment package in the United States, and of course the furlough scheme over here in the UK, we're actually recognizing that as a society, if we organize things a little better, we're more than productive enough, even in this year where we've done very little, to make sure that everybody is adequately looked after. We just have to work out ways to organize that. And I think this is a very exciting time in terms of how we look at the possibilities for doing that. And it's very encouraging to see topics ranging from universal basic income to uh, the four-day week gaining momentum in all sorts of different geographies. Anyway, I think at that point, I shall leave it there. I see that I'm at 32 minutes, which means I'm a little bit longer than I probably should have been. James, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. And there's a lot of things to unpick there. But what I would um, like to do now <clears throat> is just to take you back a bit in, in, in your own personal time, your own life, and um, ask if you tell us a little bit about the fascinating background to how you got into anthropology, but have also become an advisor to the Foreign Office and the World Bank and now run a think tank just so we can get a sort of sense of your journey. I'm ha happy to do that. I, um, look, my journey into anthropology was a relatively simple one. Um, you know, and as with all, 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 all things, the beginnings were actually pretty humble. In, I grew up in South Africa during the apartheid era, and I was one of the last generations. I left school in 1988 and was promptly called up to join the first infantry battalion in a border town called Palabawa. Um, on the border with Zimbabwe. And my inclination was I was far more inclined to fight for the other side. So um, I managed, for, fortunately, through family connections to leave. And I came to Britain, um, where I went and started studying at St. Andrews University um, in Scotland. And I actually was there to study English literature um, rather than anything. But um, the enforced course in Anglo-Saxon persuaded me that anthropology looked more interesting. Um, also, anthropology, I learned, was that at the end of your third year, obviously with a four-year Scottish degree, you had the option of taking a term off to do fieldwork. And that, to me, sounded like a great idea. Eventually, when that came about, I 
had been so destroyed by the coldness of the Scottish weather um, that I just wanted to go to the hottest place I could think of, and that was the Kalahari Desert. Um, and I knew, of course, about the Jinwasi and the Bushmen, and I'd always been intrigued by that part of the world. And so I literally hitched there, and then the rest, as they say, is history. I, I discovered I got on extremely well with um, the various Bushmen people I was working with, and it's not just Jinwasi, there are many other um, Khoisan language groups. Um, I worked in particular with the Haikum in Atosha National Park in Namibia, and then with Naron and Glikwe in the Central Kalahari Game Reserve in Botswana. Um, but, you, you know, as we all discover, there, it's, it's a thing that I suppose we all have one way or another. There are places one goes where one feels instantly at home. And I certainly felt a definite and instinctive kinship with the Jinwasi. We got on well, we understood each other. There's a phrase in Jinwa, in Zakhoakwe, which means we see each other. We saw each other and we get on. And I remain very close. I remain very close with them. Um, and at the same time, there were tremendous land rights issues and things going on there at the time. And I, being a fairly politically motivated individual, courtesy of um, growing up under apartheid, I got clearly linked within all that. And I've vaguely continued that work. As we say, Anthropos um, was an organization I set up a few years ago, specifically to start looking at how we could use anthropology to solve in particular development and land right problems. Um, it is very much, and my approach to anthropology has always been field work based. Um, and regrettably, as with many organizations over the last year, the inability to travel has basically meant that I've put Anthropos largely on ice. Um, and I've spent most of the last, last year actually focusing on dealing with issues around this book and touring, <laughs> touring in a Zoom way. But I'm hoping as soon as we're able to travel again, that I will be able to return back to the Kalahari, where the last set of projects I was doing were really looking at genetic rights issues, partially because um, the Khoisan genes um, are, they have a very interesting set of genetic linkages, which is part of the reason that we know that Homo sapiens lineage stretches back 300,000 years. And so I'd been working in particular, firstly doing research site, but then looking at ways to make sure that we actually protect, protect IP and for um, communities in terms of their genetic material and so on. Um, so that's been the focus. I look forward to the world changing a little bit again so I can get back to doing some interesting work with Anthropos. Thank you. Now, your, the book that you, you published just at the end of last year has a wonderful one word title, work, and it's subtitled The History of How We Spend Our Time. It, it's completely fascinating, but I was wondering, did it grow out of your first book, Affluence Without Abundance, which was praised by all sorts of people, but particularly um, Yuval Noah Harari, or, or is it an entirely separate project? Um, it's very much not a separate project. Um, it, in fact, one, it, it did indeed grow out of it, past, partially with the nagging of my agent and publishers. Um, the first book, Affluence Without Abundance, really tells the story of Southern Africa, the Jinwasi, hunter-gatherers, and my many years of work with them. But it's a book that segued into these very big themes about human evolution, about work, and about economics. Um, but it was a book primarily about Jinwasi, um, Southern Africa, and the region, and the people that I met there, and the people I still have relationships with, and how the Jinwasi saw their world. And it was, in a sense, a quite an emotional book in that sense. It was very much a book to do with um, me. Whereas this book, um, that book I like to sometimes describe as the heart book. This is the head version of the same story. So this was taking some of the bigger ideas that were in that book in particular as they related to work and economics and scarcity and how people saw the world and start looking at what its implications are for us now in a much more substantive way and also to take some of those ideas and explore them further myself to look more carefully at things such as um, the impact of farming and then also to look more carefully at recent history in particular things such as how our ideas and engagement around questions of equality for example um, shape our attitudes to work and our aspirations. Um, and so, yes, the relationship between the two is I see the first book very much as the heart and this one as the head.
Um, and in a way, they can be read to read together. Um, the first one's got better stories. Well, I haven't read the first one, but I will look it out. But the you know, the second one is head, but head informed by heart, I would guess. Um, you say in that book that today work brings us meaning. And that for 95% of our history, as you were saying in your talk, this was not the case. Given that in developed societies, we need paid work to earn our livings and to survive, how do you see the post-COVID future, and especially with the threat of the climate crisis that's hanging over us? Well, um, I'd like to say that, as I said at the end of my talk, I'd like to think that the post-COVID future is a little bit better. Work does bring us meaning. I think work has always brought us some kind of meaning. So again, one of the key things, points that I make in the book is that we do have a very fundamental relationship with work. And it's something that I have. I just think it's gone slightly wonky. Um, you know, so if one goes back all the way through our deep history, you know, there are all these wonderful, you know, there's a items like the, you know, some ancient pieces of um, stone tool making from 700,000 years ago. You look at them, and these are not just purely functional objects. These are objects of love where somebody has put work and found meaning and satisfaction and purpose in creating it. And we are creatures like that. What um, my concern is, is that the way we organize our economy actually denies us many of the real pleasures of finding meaning in work. So when you're sitting in a factory stacking boxes or as an Uber delivery, Uber driver or something, you're actually deprived a great deal of that meaning that comes from work, that absolute satisfaction that can come from work. And we don't get that sense of satisfaction. So in, it's interesting dealing in particular, I've been doing a lot of discussions and Zooms with sort of Amer American audiences where there is this kind of, you know, there's at the moment this sort of real hustle culture um, and there's this great sense of, you know, people feel very unable to relax. They talk about a thing, they call it the Sunday Scaries, one of the reviewers of, of a book called it, which is the fact that, you know, on a Sunday they were sitting feeling, I ought to be doing something important. I ought to be working. I'm unsatisfied. And part of it is, is that a lot of the work we do, I think, doesn't bring us a great deal of satisfaction. So it doesn't fulfill us. It's like having a meal that never quite empties. So the Zunwasi, for example, talks about hunting as very satisfying work. People say, well, why weren't they bored if they only work three hours a day? A Zunwa man, as he put it about hunting, he says, hunting makes my heart happy, my legs heavy, and my belly full. I can rest afterwards. And that is part of the problem, I think, with a lot of our work, is that we don't have that ability to rest, to turn off, um, partially because it doesn't bring us that satisfaction, but also partially because it's never quite finished. We're constantly fixated on future things. Will I get the book published to the, uh, published on time? Will it earn me enough to pay a pension? This entire future focusedness of it all. Um, as far as the changes that happen now, I, again, I think it's, you know, we're in a very interesting time. Um, and I think one of the lessons that's coming out of um, COVID is, as I said, the fact that actually as an economy, we are resourced to look after one another without working as hard as we do. This year, we really haven't done a great deal of work. We spent a lot of time fretting over the keyboard and logging into Zoom conferences. But in terms of the actual mechanics, we've had food on our table um, where people have gone hungry. That's a problem not of supply, but of distribution. That's a political and economic issue. That's something that we can solve. And I like to think that this realization we've had might bring us to a point where we can start addressing some of these more fundamental issues. And the most obvious one for me really is that, as I again mentioned earlier in the talk, is that we have this profound issue to do with um, climate change at the moment. Um, and not just climate change, but also environmental degradation. You know, we, you know, our productive mindset that we came about with farming has fundamentally transformed the planet. And one example that I like to think about from farming in particular is that, you know, 10,000 years ago, humans and our domestic animals made up, you know, a, a minuscule proportion of the total living biomass on Earth. We made up less than a fraction of a percent of even the proportion of mammalian biomass. So the total mass of just ma mammal life on Earth. Now, humans and their domestic animals comprise 96% of all mammalian bio life, um, biomass. And at the same time, we have four times as much mammalian biomass as we did a century ago. 
Um, so in other words, we've been sitting translating energy into mammalian life. This is the, you know, this is the reason why, you know, cows farting is a greenhouse gas challenge. Um, when a century ago, elephants farting wasn't a greenhouse challenge. We just have four times as much mammalian biomass. Um, and that's really because we've converted fossil fuels effectively into, into living food that we then slaughter and serve up. So there are all these big questions. And I think for me, the key is that when we start approaching how to deal with these questions, we live in unprecedented times. We don't have solutions. We can't go back to tired old solutions. We're in an era where we have to experiment. And we have to experiment urgently. And if we're going to undertake these experiments, it's best to do them unencumbered by a series of sort of rather than being hogtied to a series of assumptions about human nature and scarcity and greed, um, that we should liberate ourselves to think more freely about how we must engage with them and so be free to experiment in a far more open and functional way. Thank you. Now, that brings us on to a key question, which is if... Um, if we're to have a, a, a rethink, a reset and a rethink, hundreds of years of attitudes built towards in, in order to achieve a living, you have to work. In order to achieve a good living, you have to work hard or be working in an area of, of scarcity, for example, a skill set that uh, not many people have. Um, you, we have a the population of Britain is what, 67, United Kingdom is, is approximately 67 million. There are, you know, that's a massive number of individual attitudes, as it were, that would have to, would have to change. Do you, have you thought about how that might happen at all? Um, mercifully, not a great deal, actually. I mean, this is, in a sense, it, it's sort of, it's, you know, why I, I, if I think about a role in this, I mean, I'd like to imagine myself as somebody who helps loosen the thinking of people who are in a better position to start pushing and changing attitudes. Certainly, you know, I feel we're in a very strange political place at the moment, both here in Britain and in many other places. And I think in part it's a reflection of the fact that we really are engaged in these far more fundamental changes. We have an economy organized on the assumptions of scarcity, yet we live in an era of astonishing abundance, and things don't seem to work particularly well. Our problem is, is that we continuously expect our politicians and others to have ready-made answers for us. Here is what we can do to solve this problem. I tend to approach things more as an engineer. Um, as an engineer, you have to experiment. You have to try things out. Um, and you have to be prepared for them to fail. I really wish that we actually had a political party called the Try and Fail Party, um, who, would they, who would suggest that what we'll do is try various forms um, of whether it's governance or engagement or economic organization, and be prepared to take the lessons we can get from them and move forward on the basis of that. So I, for example, would love to see something <laughs> trialed along the lines of a universal basic income. Um, you know, we're practically doing it almost with a furlough scheme. I just think it's a fairly unequal and clumsy way of doing it. But I would love to see that experiment carried forward in a much more substantial way. This is what Andrew Yang had promised when he did his presidential nomination for the Democrats in the United States. And I'd like to see something like that happen. And it seems to me this is the obvious time in which to do it. But we just need to be brave enough to do that experiment. But at the same time, to be brave enough to do that experiment, we also have to be brave enough to accept that that experiment might fail. Um, I would like to see what happens with the universal basic income. I think I'd like to think it will work, but I also am perfectly prepared to say that the only way we can know it is by trying a substantial experiment in the way that we've tried a substantial experiment with working from home and discovered actually it's not the disaster we thought it was. Similarly, I'd like to see experiments around things like the four day week. And, um, you know, really what I'd also like to do is see experiments in creating greater equity. So one of the things that I think persuades a lot of us to work and consume as we do is simply that as a species, I think we react very poorly to inequality. It's a major theme of the first book, Affluence Without Abundance, is the, how the Zhenoisi were fiercely egalitarian. Um, and uh, the indications are that actually this is something common to all forager societies, all small-scale forager societies. Um, and that 
they managed their aspirations by having effectively very few of them and making sure everybody was equal. A lot of our aspirations, our gold-plated aspirations, come from really seeing somebody having something that we don't or imagining that they don't. We live in this era of sort of gold-plated Instagram aspiration where you have influencers all trying to produce this kind of synthetic life which looks absolutely wonderful and makes people aspire to having it. So it's really how we engage with this question of aspiration. And I think societies where resources are distributed a little more evenly um, diminishes this kind of intense aspiration. I don't, I, you know, I don't want my gold plated toilet seat. Um, so that, that's, that's something I'd really like to see. And I'd like to see us making better use of our prosperity. But as I say, you know, the key for me is to acknowledge that we have to experiment. That is the ultimate that is the ultimate choice I think we have is we have to be prepared to experiment. We have to accept the failure in those experiments, but we also have to recognize that we have to experiment fairly urgently um, because the problems we have are not going away. Thank you. Well, you've actually anticipated the first um, question in the Q&A, which was what are your thoughts on universal base, basic income and what do uh -huh. we need to do to make sure that UBI is successful? Um, and uh, so we'll go on to a question that was um, sent in in advance from Catherine Poyner. As we move to a hybrid model with more home working but some time in the office, how do we foster creativity across teams and equality of access to opportunities for those at home or in the office? Mm. Well, that's again, it's a question I don't really, I don't really know the answer to. Um, look, I, I think we've, you know, as I, we've been through this extraordinary experiment of working from home and we've learned that it worked better than we thought it was. Five years ago, if you'd gone to any, you know, HR department in a big business and you'd said, well, let everybody work from home and flexibly all the time, they'd have laughed you out the door and said it's nonsense. And they tried little tinkery experiments with it. And, you know, the experiments were never of a scale to help us understand what it should look like and how well it would work. Now that we've been through this massive experiment, we've seen the benefits of it. We've also seen the costs of it. So we have seen the fact that there is a certain loss of energy that happens. But Zoom is not as you know remarkable as it is for doing, you know, and functional, I think, for doing day-to-day -day meetings. It is not the ideal thing. I would much rather be standing on a stage today with a big screen behind me so I could show you pictures. And I find it much easier to talk and engage that way. And it's a much more creative process to engage with people directly when you can actually yeah. see them and feel that you're part of the same room. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, one of the things we're going to do is when we go back to the office, in inverted commas, I think people will recognize that there is some need for that engagement in order to keep creativity alive. But uh, I'm hoping that we'll do so with a far greater degree of balance. And I think that will deal with the same question again. Once we have the option of being able to engage with one another again, that creates better opportunities in terms of equity for employment and opportunity. I think it's a very tough time for, in particular, young entrants into the job market this year. I mean, it's been a real nightmare year for them and a very, very difficult process. And this is, you know, and I suspect that actually we're going to see a hangover of this going into the longer term. And that, of course, touches back into the other big issue, which is, you know, there are fewer good jobs around, largely as a result of automation. You know, we keep hearing that, you know, uh, you, I suppose before the pandemic struck, everybody was focused on what are the implications of robots going to eat our job. And you had this kind of feedback with groups like the World Economic Forum saying, actually, well, technology is creating you know, as many jobs as it destroys. But the truth is, lots of people have, you know, the, the number of good quality jobs that are appearing are diminishing very quickly. Um, and, you know, there's actually, there's a, I can't remember the exact link, but there's a, there's a, a new job quality <laughs> index measurement in the state, um, which looks simply just at the number of well-rewarded jobs that come in the market. And those are very much in decline. And that's because we're in a very different world and things are changing very fast. And I think we need to start anticipating and engaging with these bigger issues. Right, now we've got a number of questions, but uh, infinite questions, but limited time. Yes. So I'm gonna to go to uh, pick out two. The first is this from Tony Hasler. With the huge creation and injection of fiat currencies into the world, mm 
Don't you think that the centralized machine is going to manipulate our children and grandchildren towards working and spending more in order to pay back tax to balance the books? How can we avoid that powerful manipulation? Um, by recognizing that that you know money is a fiction, and I mean a fiction in the sense of it's something made, fictio in the Latin sense, it's a creation. It's a set. Of, it's a representative of a set of obligations between us. The one thing I think which has been really interesting with this pandemic is the discussion around magic money trees. Um, we have seen governments take on levels of debt that century, you know, that five, two years ago would have been absolutely unfathomable and partially in the recognition that debt doesn't need to be paid back um, we live again in such a highly capitalized world there's so much wealth around far more than actually is necessary and i think we're really out of point this is the key point john maynard Keynes actually made in that essay was that we're on the cusp of a far more fundamental economic revolution about the, you know, it's not just about working less, it's about a complete change in how we organize our values around wealth, money, and debt. Um, and I would like to think that we're at that point and that this pandemic has pushed us a little bit closer to it. Um, you know, whether that proves to be the case or not. Um, you know, my sense is, is that, again, this kind of, you know, there's a degree of consumption exhaustion going on. And I don't know whether it's maybe it's my my hunter gatherer approach to fatherhood, but I I'm continuously encouraged by the fact that my children every time I have to buy them a Christmas present or birthday present and I ask them what they want, they have no idea what they want. They're like, well, actually, Papa, I don't really want anything. Um, you, you know, my son, the only I buy him are ants for ant farm. Yeah. So, um, I I tend to I tend to have a lot of a, a lot of faith. We you know we simply. Because many of our basic needs are met, I think this, I think there's a degree of aspiration exhaustion, or I'd like to think that there is, and I think that's the kind of organic change that hopefully will spare our children from having to having to work ridiculous hours doing really pointless stuff. Um, and I think there is also the recognition that a lot of the jobs people do are, in the famous words of another anthropologist, David Graeber, bullshit jobs. Uh, they lead to, they offer them very little in the way of satisfaction and they don't contribute a great deal to the world anyway. So I'd like to hope that we're getting there and one chips away at these ideas very slowly. And I hope one does it by writing books like this. And I'm certainly not the only one who's written books like this. There's an astonishingly sophisticated um, new economic literature from donut economics to post-growth economics. Um, and to me, that suggests that there is a sea change happening um, and that they are recognizing that many of these economic ideas that we have now are somewhat archaic and they did they are archaic they emerged during an era when we were farmers and you know that was when 80 percent of us lived and worked the land including children 200 years ago now 1.3 percent of us provide so much food that half of it half of the food we produce ends up in landfill and that obesity is a far bigger health issue than going hungry Right. I've now sabotaged my script. No, oh, here we go. So this is the last question um, from Gina Dowding. How do you think this relates to our planning for pensions, old age and fear of not having enough, which seem to give some in the financial industry a rationale for ignoring our finite resources? Well, that's a, again, it's an interesting problem. That's, you know, it's it's certainly we're in a very strange place when it comes to pensions, you know, in the sort of the world John Maynard Keynes imagined, we'd be working less, retiring earlier, and the work we'd be doing would all be on jobs that we enjoyed because effectively all our basic needs are met. And this is, again, where I see things like the universal basic income, again, becoming an interesting experiment to do. Because universal basic income effectively does away with the needs for a cumbersome pension program. It's really just simply a way of ensuring that everybody has a guaranteed income at every level that's adequate for people at whatever stage in life they happen to be. Um, and I do think, you know, we're sitting on, you know, pensions again are one of the things. Part of the problem with organizing our economy on a set of principles which were developed during the agricultural era is that they are just no longer fit for purpose. And so we're seeing things like our pension system coming under strain 
largely because it's like using a you know it's it's like having a ox it's like trying to draw it's like having a, a some oxen draw um, <laughs> or draw draw a lorry along which runs on diesel it just doesn't work it it's it adds additional weight it adds complications and it creates complications um, you know there are other complications that arise very much from you know as an organic result from having this system of scarcity predicated on the assumption of scarcity and that is in an era where everything is increasingly automated and that is increasing inequality um, and this is simply an obvious and organic result from the fact of a more automated economy more automated economy is an economy made up of more capital assets where access to wealth access to capital um, becomes far more determinant of greater determinant of future prosperity than whether you're prepared to work or not. In fact, it becomes the only key one. And you see this very clearly, bizarrely, actually, in African economies like Botswana and Namibia, where they're mining economies, and mining used to be very labor intensive. And these are African countries which are middle-income countries. They're one of a handful of African middle-income countries in the UN index with GDPs that are the um, GDP per capita, which is really quite high, sort of a equivalent with Southeast Asian countries, yet you have unemployment there at 60%. And that's because the industries that produce that wealth are capitalized. They're highly capital intensive. They're machinery intensive, not labor intensive. So you have very few jobs being created, but you have adequate wealth with which to support people. And so this narrative of the job and the responsibility is something that I think needs a complete reshake and recheck into the future. But it is, as we've said, it's such a humongous thing to tear apart this kind of astonishing infrastructure of norms and institutions that has congealed around the economics of scarcity. But taking it apart is very difficult. And as I said right at the beginning, we're we're very intransigent species when it comes to change. We we prefer to stick to things that we know, even when they are wrong, um, and even when they harm us, rather than face the prospect of change. This is we are, after all. You know, I, I suspect probably the only species anywhere that engages in activities like smoking, where we'll knowingly continue to do it, even though we're knowing we're shortening our lives. James, thank you. That was a really stimulating um, talk, and the answers to the various questions were uh, were also really good. Now, to our audience, you can buy James's fascinating and passionately argued book, Work: A History of How We Spend Our Time from the Litfest online bookshop. And every purchase you make through our bookshop helps us to fund future events. And we hope you'll, enjoy, you'll be able to join us for the last talk in this series, starting later this afternoon with author, photographer, and broadcaster, Johnny Pitts on social justice, and then for the panel discussion with AC Grayling at uh, five o'clock. But before we all go our separate ways, if you enjoyed today's event, don't forget to click on the donate button at the bottom of your screen or go to our website, www.litfest.org. And you can be sure that every penny you give will go towards creating exciting future projects and events and strengthening Litfest as an independent arts charity. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you again to James. I'm sorry we can't have a debrief in the green room because um, that's not how Crowdcast works. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.